Andy's supposed to handle it. Andy's supposed to have it. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, welcome. We got a good turnout, so I'm really happy about that. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves and then we'll start our panel discussion. I know P um, some of you may have a lot of questions or a few questions. If you can hold all your questions till everybody's finished giving their, their speech and their roles and responsibilities, and then we'll do our best to ask, answer any questions you guys might have, okay? So first of all, thank you for coming. On behalf of the Sheriff's Department, I'd like to welcome you to a uh, very good turnout of a wildfire prevention and, pr and um, evacuation meeting. As you know, in the state of New Mexico, it's a tinderbox right now. <laughs> we just have to look to every direction from your homes and you'll probably see smoke, whether it's Jemez or Socorro and Rio Rancho recently, just said in the outskirts of Rio Rancho. So this is a pretty big deal and it's important that we're all on the same page and we know how we're gonna react during a fire. Uh, so first of all, I'm Joshua Campos. I'm the captain of the East Area Command with the Sheriff's Department. I'm also in charge of the Special Operations Division. So that includes our emergency response team, our K-9 unit, and our SWAT team, and our reserve deputies. And all those individuals will help during, during a fire evacuation. I'll talk more about that. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic around so everybody can just introduce themselves right quick. Chief Deputy Ray Chavez with the Sheriff's Department, and I'm over the Field Services Division, which, uh, which also oversees the Special Operations. Lieutenant Brandon Blackman, I'm the Lieutenant over Special Operations over everything Captain Campos just said, the Emergency Response Team, SWAT, K-9, et cetera. Gloria Chavez, Mayor from the Village of Tijeras. I'm Joshua Skeen, I'm with the American Red Cross. I am Stacy Lewis, I am the Operations Coordinator for the Bernalillo County Emergency Communication Center. Bill Henson, I'm the Chaplain for Bernalillo County Fire Department. Chris Sly, the Bernalillo County Fire Chief. Chris Scober, Division Chief of Bernalillo County Fire Department and Fire Marshal. Tom Wamsley, Bernalillo County Homeland Security and Emergency Management. I'm the Deputy Emergency Manager. Uh, Sheriff Manuel Gonzalez, I'm the one that's responsible for giving Josh all his assignments. <laughs> okay. And I'm Doug Cady, also with uh, the American Red Cross. So we'll begin, I'll start. This is the Sheriff's Department and this is uh, basically what we do. Um, during, the, during a wildfire, um, and we'll use Doghead for an example because that's what impacted a lot of people here in the East Mountains and in your guys' community. So during the Doghead fire or any wildfire, um, we do a consultation with the fire department and the fire personnel because obviously we're not subject matter experts. They are. They know what fires do. I don't. I know how to evacuate people and hopefully keep people safe that way and secure their property. So during a wildfire, we're gonna get with the fire department and the firefighters are gonna tell us if an evacuation should be issued. If an evacuation is issued, we order a mandatory evacuation. Now I wanna be clear that we live in the United States of America and we're protected by this great document called the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution does not allow me to go into your home and remove you from your home without your permission, absent a valid search warrant or arrest warrant from a judge. So I can't force you out of your home. 
even if it's a mandatory evacuation. If you want to stay in your home, I have to let you. However, um, forgive me, I may be a little morbid, but what my deputies are going to do when they knock on your door asking you to leave your house, they're going to ask your name, your phone number, name of next to Ken, and possibly name of your dentist. <laughs> and, I and I hate to be morbid like that, but when there is a mandatory evacuation in any area, I can no longer guarantee emergency response services should you have an emergency. So it can be a heart attack, it can be a trip and fall, it can be a burglary, it can be a car crash. Any emergency operations, I can no longer guarantee that I'm gonna send the deputies or the fire department or rescue personnel in there to rescue you guys if it's a mandatory evacuation area. So that's one reason why we have to have everybody leave when it's mandatory. Another reason, I didn't learn this until the dog head fire occurred. If people fail to evacuate during a mandatory evacuation, it greatly impacts firefighting efforts because we need fire apparatus and fire personnel to get into the area and if they're clogged with any kind of traffic, they can no longer do their job. Second of all, I'm sure you guys seen on the news, if not during the dog head fire, there was a lot of air tankers that were dropping a lot of the red slurry. While this red slurry is cold, and it's not dropped on the fire, it's dropped in front of the fire. All it's gonna do is stop the fire from moving any further, hopefully. Now, when they're doing these, these fire drops, it takes, in my opinion, in my estimate, estimation and from talking with the professionals here, <coughs> it takes about an hour for them to do all their calculations on where they're gonna part, um, drop this fire retardant. They have to find out weather conditioners, barometric pressure, wind direction, fuel type, um, terrain, where am I, where's the best part, part for me to drop this fire retardant? Once they make that determination after an hour of calculations, they send the bomber out to drop the fire retardant. A small plane flies in front of that bomber, and that's the spotter plane. And their job is to look for anybody on the ground that that fire retardant may hit or may fall on because it could possibly injure and or kill somebody because it's loaded with gravel and all kinds of other stuff. Now, if they see somebody with a fire hose or a, a water hose or a water bucket or a car in their backyard where they're going to be dropping that fire retardant, they're going to abort their drop. And it's not like they can just fly around again and drop it in another spot. They have to land that fully loaded plane, take another hour to do all the calculations over again because things change and it might not be ideal to drop it in the same spot. So basically, they lost an hour of firefighting efforts because somebody refused to evacuate. Okay, so that's another reason why it's very important. And I'm sure these other professionals will be able to add more onto that. Like I said, I'm not the subject matter expert. Um, another concern, and it's a big concern of mine as well, and I'm speaking for the Sheriff's Department now, we want to protect people's property. And we understand that if everybody leaves a community, there's bad guys in our community. We understand that. And we know that they're opportunists. And they may try to enter your neighborhood and or burglarize your guys' homes. So that's where the great lieutenant here comes into play. He's in charge of 40 plus emergency response team deputies that at the sheriff's direction can order these guys up, basically order them to work and we put them on 12 hour shifts. And their only job during the fire evacuation is to set up the evacuation area roadblocks and patrol the neighborhoods. They're making contact with everybody and anybody in the neighborhood to make sure they have reason to be there. So that's one reason how we're gonna help protect your guys' property. Um, if you need help during a, a fire for evacuations, plan ahead. There are some people on oxygen. Some people may have family members that are bedridden. They need to make those plans early on. The fire department, Albuquerque Ambulance, the Sheriff's Department, we will make the best effort possible to arrange for someone to drive to your house in a rescue truck and load, load a patient into the ambulance just to get them out of the area. So just plan ahead. Um, during, during the dog head fire, um, I got a lot of complaints from, I shouldn't say a lot, a few complaints from some residents. They were saying, I'm not in a mandatory evacuation area. Why did you shut off my power? <laughs> well, we shut off everything. We make an evacuation determination based on what's easier, easiest and safest for us to secure an area with the limited amount of resources we have. So we may say everything south of North 14 is an evacuation area. But the power grids that we're all on a co-op up here, on electrical co-ops, don't follow the road lines. We follow the road lines. So my power may be on and I may be in an evacuation area. My next door neighbor may not be in the evacuation area and his or her power may be off. So we can't go by just power, just go by the, the areas that we're, that we're speaking of, okay? 
Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you little roll, you little roll. <laughs> um, traffic control. The very last thing that the sheriff's department wants to do with traffic is shut down a road. That is very difficult for us to do, and it impacts an entire community, especially in the East Mountains. We can just go back to wintertime when the interstate gets shut down for one reason or another. It impacts the entire community because nobody can get through anywhere. But ro roadblocks, granted, they, we don't want to do them, but sometimes they are necessary. There may be threats and dangers in an area that you guys don't know about, that we know about, and we're trying to keep you safe. Down power lines, tree limbs, um, they call them hail makers, widow, widow makers, widow makers that just fall on people when the fire goes through. So those are some other reasons that we may, may um, block the road. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Commissioner Wayne Johnson. Thank you for coming. Oh, you're not going to have me talk now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, thank you for coming. Thank a uh, round of applause for uh, Captain Campos for putting this together. <laughs> this was really his brainchild, and uh, maybe you can get a peek behind the curtain here of what goes on in the decisions that are made and what we know as, as some incident develops and what we really don't know. I think a lot of times people think when we're sitting in this EOC that we've got an exact map of what's going on everywhere during the fire and that uh, map's changing like a video game or something like that. And the truth is nothing even like that. It's uh, We're waiting just like you are. And one of the things we tried to do last year during doghead fires, get you as, as uh, accurate information as we possibly could because once these things start up, rumors start flying. And you don't know where the roadblocks are. There's there's always a, a rumor of the fire crossing a road or something else. And so making sure you have accurate information has always been one of the things that were most important during that time period. But I didn't mean to interrupt his, his speech there, and I'll say a few words later. But thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Chief Grober. He's the fire marshal for Bernal County. All right. Thanks again. So just to kind of touch base a little bit on, on the fire department's role, uh, not only during initial attack or when the fire first starts, but during those hours after that fire starts and what's going to happen and how we make the decision to start evacuating neighborhoods and stuff like that. Um, so really it comes down to life safety and mainly life safety of the residents but also the life safety of our firefighters. Uh, we're not going to put our firefighters into a situation that's going to put them at an undue risk or a heightened risk. Uh, fighting fire of course is dangerous in itself but we're not going to put our firefighters into a situation that uh, we can lose a life, especially a firefighter's life. Uh, so with that being said, some of that planning uh, goes on, like uh, Captain said, hours before, sometimes hours before, sometimes it's minutes. We've got to make that switch or uh, turn that switch on and say we're evacuating this neighborhood uh, just because what the fire is doing and, and what the weather is doing. Uh, sometimes we don't have a lot of time, so <coughs> excuse me. Uh, that fire, like we saw in the doghead last year, spread a, a huge amount in a little amount of time, a couple of hours. So we always keep that in mind. Uh, and also we ask that if you do want to stay back behind, just realize that we're not going to be there with you staying behind. If it's we're telling you to get out, we're we'll probably be the same way and not go back into that neighborhood. So <coughs> we will try to do our best to uh, protect neighborhoods the best we can. Uh, but some of that is on you too. Uh, create your defensible space. Do the stuff now to help protect your home. Uh, it will help us in the future. <coughs> if you want to jump in, Chief. Keep going? <laughs> All right. I'm on a roll. Here we go. So, and then... Captain Capos talked about a little bit about power lines too, and a lot of that too is firefighter safety as well. We'll shut down entire grids of power lines just based on where the fire is going or where the fire is predicted to go because fire burns through there and knocks down the poles, and now we have live power lines laying on the ground. So that's another danger we look for. <coughs> and really, so like Campos said, if you're asked to leave, please leave. Um, it's just 
imperative that you guys realize it's not easy for us to call for an evacuation, but we're doing it for a reason, and that reason is life safety. Is, is there anything that you would like them to do before they leave your home set off propane tanks or tires? Or yeah, I mean, you can shut, off, shut down your propane tank, but um, typically it's not the the fast mo moving fire that we see on TV that is going to ignite your home on fire is the small embers after that fire passes through that's going to ignite your fire. So make sure your dry leaves are pushed away from your house, raked up, your gutters are clean, uh, your furniture, your patio furniture is put away, that sort of thing. So. So before we get into like our role in a, in a fire, I kind of want to talk about what we've learned over the last year from our emergency management perspective. And we looked at the fire and we went back and did a real thorough review of our plans or procedures. And we realized we did a lot of great things and there's a couple of things we can improve upon. Um, we started staging additional equipment up here for sheltering, for whatever it is that we need. Um, we started training additional staff. Uh, I'll get into some of that training that's gone on, but that was a big initiative for us is to get more folks trained. Uh, we coordinated with a lot of our stakeholders. We meet regularly um, with the East Mountain Interagency Fire Protection Association. We meet this morning or this afternoon for our East Mountain Wildfire Operations Plan. Um, we started conducting more exercises because it's great to have a plan, but if we're not out there practicing it, we really don't know if it's gonna work. Um, we've purchased some more equipment to make sure we have what we need and what the, our first responders have. Um, and then we've done a lot of outreach. We recently conducted a program called Wise and Ready, and we looked at our senior population and worked with them to develop uh, plans to be ready to go if something happens. So that's kind of where we, we learned from the dog head. Um, so kind of we talked about when the sheriff's office comes out and says, hey, it's time to leave, we need to have a go kit, right? We need to have those basic items with us ready to go. Uh, prescription medications is really a big thing. You know, we can't send them back in to get your meds. Right, a copy of prescription, if you have extra medicine, have that ready to go. Your important documents, um, whatever that may is that you don't want to leave in your house, have that ready to go, know where it is. Five minutes I can grab everything and go. Um, dog food, right? I don't want Fluffy to have to eat the kennel food. Let's make sure if they're on a special diet or they, they have a medicine, we don't forget about them. Um, really, let's make sure that we know how to get out of our neighborhood. We get a question a lot of evacuation routes. We can't predict an evacuation route because we don't know where the fire is going to come from. So know two or three different ways in and out of your neighborhood. Um, I'll talk about some of the sh shelter locations, but know where those places are, how to get to them. Um, and then know if my family, if my wife's at work, where do I meet her? Wh how do I communicate with my family members if, if we're not home? Um, and kind of the last thing, know about my neighbor. Know that the, the lady down the street, you know what, she's bedridden. Is it my job to check on them? Should I communicate with them? because we'll do the best we can, but sometimes we don't know that, oh, they just broke their leg and they're bedridden, right? We should check on our neighbors. So kind of we ask that of you um, on the preparedness side. So after the evacuation order has been given, one of the things that we're gonna do is set up a shelter. Um, we have two different community centers in the East Mountains, plus a middle school, Roosevelt Middle School, and Los Vecinos and Vista Grande are all our shelters here in the East Mountains. We've done a, an amazing work with the Red Cross. They've gone out and assessed all our, si our sites, made sure they're ready to go, um, looked at like our ADA compliance. Are we looking at everybody, not just you know the, the people that can walk? You know, are we looking at our bedridden? How are we helping them? Uh, our park and rec department has taken huge steps forward. Um, they've gone through all the shelter training. They're just as trained, well trained as the folks here in Red Cross. They're shelter managers, shelter support staff. They've taken that initiative to be this is our community, we're gonna take care of it. Um, they're actually been kind of put on alert at other times to help out in other jurisdictions because of their level of training. Um, we've worked on our agreements to provide meals. So you go to a shelter, we're gonna take care of the food, we'll feed you. Uh, we have our shelter kits ready to go. A lot of you guys, when you walked in, you saw a cot set up. That's the equipment, when we set up a shelter, that's what you, the kind of the, the conditions that you're gonna have. It's a cot, two blankets, a pillow, and a hygiene kit. Uh, you can talk with the folks at Red Cross. We actually have pretty good stuff, still clean in a box. <laughs> so um, it's good. One of the things that, you know, a lot of us, when we think about sheltering, I don't know, what comes to me is like the convention center during Katrina, right? Dirty, filthy. That's not the case. 
our park and rec folks take really good care of the, their centers. So you know, don't, don't expect this to be something dingy and the rest of it. Now it's going to be cramped. You know, we can't really avoid that. I'd ask you to take a few minutes to look at what's out there on the way out and just kind of understand that if I had to go to a shelter and sleep on a cot, you know, maybe I want to make sure I have a blanket or I want to bring my little my pillow or my teddy bear with me <laughs> to be comfortable there. <laughs> um, and then also with that, if you guys take a look, we have signage. So if we open up a shelter, we're going to put signs out on the highway so you guys know where to go. That was kind of a big thing that we, we took away from this. Where are the shelters? Um, updates. Uh, I think... I think like uh, the commissioner said about the information about what's going on, we don't really know that much. And so us getting that to you. Oh, that uh, didn't sound good. <laughs> 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 Let's rephrase that a little bit. So from the fire side, their updates usually will come out about twice a day. So we're getting that information from them and pushing it out to you as best we can. But oftentimes we're waiting for what is the, that incident management team that's out there, what are they reporting to us so that we can pass it on to you. So that's one of the things we looked at is how are we going to um, provide that data back to you, whether it's going to be briefings, if information tables. Again, each uh, situation will be different, but that's kind of one of the things that we took on. Um, how many people here have pets? <laughs> Better go back and work my numbers. Um, so one of the, the great things that the county has done is our animal services. Um, we have animal sheltering teams and animal transport teams. So if we set up a shelter, we will have a, an animal shelter co-located at that facility. So bring your cat, your dog, your duck, whatever it is, bring that down there. Uh, livestock, we have uh, anim large animal transport teams. We'll transport that livestock down to the state fairgrounds. Um, they've done amazing things. They work really, really hard to, to do this. So um, that's kind of the things that we're hoping to prepare for you. Um, and then with that, those important documents, your, you know, rabies tag and those kind of things. If we bring animals into the shelter, <coughs> at some point in that first hour or first day or so, if we can't find vaccination records, our animal services will provide the vaccines so that we're not cross-contaminating the other animals and the rest of it. So if nothing else, know your vet. What's my vet's phone number? How do I reach them? Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is staying informed. Um, that nowadays, there's a thousand different ways to get information. I think the county does a great job with our social media sites as far as finding out what's going on. A lot of you probably found out about this through social media. Uh, kind of pay attention to those things. All of our official updates will go out through websites, through social media. Um, we'll co coordinate really well with our partners at the media. So you'll hear it on TV, see it on the or hear it on the radios. Um, we actually have an AM radio station that we can set up. So maybe the next time we have something, that will be something to provide information to you guys. You can tune in to 1670 or 1690, and we'll just have, hey, here's the shelter, whatever information we have. Again, you know, there's not one way that's going to reach everybody, so we try and look at as many different ways. Uh, the last part, or we kind of have two, we have a, a system called Nixle. I put some flyers out front. Uh, sign up for it. We push anything from weather warnings to mandatory evacuation information. Uh, we don't bombard you with every, it's going to rain tomorrow. If it's something that we feel is a threat, we're going to push that information out so that you feel relevant. Um, Stacy will talk about the county's mass notification system here in a little bit um, that, that does that automatic notification. But um, those are just kind of the things from the emergency management side. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to follow up and touch on was the uh, scene security. But before I do, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Captain Josh Campos. Uh, you're probably not going to get a more committed person to uh, do the emergency management for the sheriff's side up here. Uh, he planned, staffed, resourced, got us all the information we needed so we could uh, get the, the staffing we needed up here to appropriately de deal with that situation. So without his commitment, and I say that, he literally slept here at the station, and I can't guarantee he took a shower, but he did s <laughs> he did stay up here, anyway. all right, during, during the whole event. And I, so I think that speaks volumes for his, his level of commitment. So if you could give him a round of applause, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> so in ter just the only thing I think to maybe touch on in terms of scene security, because I think Josh did a great job about informing you about evacuations, but uh, another role for our deputies to do is to de deny or give access to that scene. 
And if you, even though you live here, at the point if you're not sheltered in and you don't want to leave your home, he said, that's your right, and we're going to support you in that. But at the point if you're not in the scene, you won't be given access because we have to guarantee the safety of the people that are fire, fighting the fire, fires and patrolling uh, the streets for you. So at that point, we can't give that up. And also, we don't know the cause of the fire, so we still treat it as a, as a crime scene. So that's what we have to look at. We have to keep the integrity of the scene. So that was just a little uh, tidbit of information I think that we needed to touch on so you'll know why we're there. Uh, we want to give you access, but you know, just for, for security of uh, yourselves and for the deputies, we can't. So that being said, I'll just pass the mic. Thank you. My name, uh, again, is Doug Cady. We work with these agencies. We, we train with them. We understand what their role is, and we totally understand what our role is as well. Department of Homeland Security Emergency Management has set up a wonderful deal with the Bernalillo County people and the shelter. How many people were s uh, displaced by the doghead fire here? Okay. Well, did So most of you haven't experienced a shelter perhaps then. But they've got a great sheltering system here, and I know that um, I was it CERT that set up the other in Estancia, right? So again, we work with them; they work with us. We all work very closely together. We get information as quickly as we can, and we disseminate it and we send it out to you. They do anyway. Our side is strictly the sheltering and assisting them with what they're doing here. Now, and you get into another county, perhaps we don't have that good of a system set up through that county sheriff department or emergency management team and that's where we'll bring the red cross in and we of course are always ready to set up a shelter elsewhere besides just uh, here in the canyon and stuff and all around the city and stuff but we're here to help you we're here to give you a hot shower if that's what you need a cool place to stay in the summer we we feed meals we do snacks if you need some water we have pet care and everything else in the event that you are evacuated so it's just a team effort and this is a good example of it. This is a pretty good swatch of the people that are involved in uh, helping you all out when we get into an emergency situation. So I'll pass it on. I'm sorry. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention CERT. They're, they're here. I see some representatives here. Would you guys like to give a brief on what you guys do and, and how you guys organize stuff during a fire? Or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> okay. Besides, that's my job. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try not to compete. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Community Emergency Response Team, or CERTS, opened the Estancia Fairgrounds, and we were there for nine days, 24-7, uh, and we sheltered uh, over 300 animals and about 15, 20 people. Most of the people weren't there, but what we sheltered were herd animals or hoofed animals. We didn't do a lot of dogs and cats. So we were there with the big animals, so... You know, we were there, we're here to help. We will come out to your communities and talk just like they do. We probably have more time than they do to come out to your communities and talk to you about being prepared and getting prepared. So there's some literature outside, or you can talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll be glad to talk to you about CERT or DART. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Oh, okay, so once again, my name is Stacy Lewis. I'm with the uh, Bernalillo County Emergency Communications Center. Most of you um, will have called 911 um, or called our non-emergency number, 798-7000. Um, our role or the commu communications center's role in this process will be one where you are going to call us for assistance and or we at the behest of either either the sheriff sheriff's department or the fire chief and the fire and his and his department they're going to make that request that we either evacuate or make a mass notification to a certain area of town so at that point they will have given us a grid um a uh, a radius polygon or whatever of a community that they would like a mass notification message broadcast out. At that point, we draw that boundary for your community and we would put out a message. The message could be anything like, 
um, large fire in your area, all residents shelter in place. Okay, when we, put, when we broadcast a message like that, shelter in place means stay home. It doesn't mean drive out and go shopping, <laughs> okay? It means stay home. We are putting out this message and we would like you to, okay, and basically so that they can, so the fire department can do their business without having dr uh, uh, regular citizens driving about in that particular area. Now for purposes of this wildland evacuation and scenes like that, maybe the message is going to be something along the lines of um, evacuation in your area. Um, this residence from here to this, from uh, this location to this location, you're going to shelter at Los Vecinos Community Center. Residents from this location to this location, you're going to shelter at a Montoya Elementary. Okay? Um, residents maybe uh, take their small animals, residents with livestock, um, wait for further instructions. Or watch tickers, watch the news tickers, things like that. Um, one of the things we may or may not also announce in that broadcast message, the communication center's phone number. So you can call and, and, and uh, ask more questions um, to get more uh, information about those type of, of where you, you know, what do you do with um, persons who are non-ambulatory, persons in a wheelchair, persons who have trouble moving around, things like that. Um, Basically, once we send out those notification messages, we know that our communication center is going to be flooded with questions, so please be patient. Don't drop the phone because nobody's picking up on 798-7000 and dial 911. We're the same location. If we can't pick you up on 798-7000, yes, you will be bumped to the top of the, the system on 911, but chances are you're not the only person calling on 911 but what you're doing is you're hampering the persons who do have a real emergency, and that's the problem, okay? Now, getting back to um, the gentlemen who were speaking regarding um, evacuations and, when, and for those people who do not want to leave their homes. Um, Captain Campos was correct in that they will not come back to the scene if you are injured, if you've fallen down in your home and your in your Neighborhood, ha neighborhood has been evacuated. Now, calling 911 and persistently calling 911 doesn't help your situation because we're the dispatch center who sends the uh, sheriff and fire services, fire and rescue, to your homes. What we can do at the communication center is we can, we're emergency medical dispatchers and emergency fire dispatchers. We can provide sa um, life saving and emergency instructions. But be, be aware that if your neighborhood has been evacuated, chances are we are not sending emergency responders. Okay, we can give you instructions on what to do to protect yourselves and to assist yourselves as best you can, but more than likely, <coughs> responders do not expect responders to come back to your home if the evacuation has been ordered. Okay? Okay, in order to sign up for the mass notification, if you haven't, if you have a landline phone, meaning that you have phone service through um, a regular phone company, CenturyLink, I'm not sure what other type of services is, are up here, um, then we have your number automatically in our um, emergency network services. Is that Nixle? No, Nixle is more a, type, a text message type of system. If, however, you use digital phone services, if you have Vonage, if you have Comcast, if you have AT&T, um, who else, CenturyLink, those are all Any digital, I'm sorry? Magic Jack. Magic Any Jack? VoIP. Any yeah. VoIP system. They are all digital type of services, and when you dial 911, we do not get your home address your phone number, things like that. You have to actually go online to those specific companies and register your information so when you dial 911, we see where you are, okay? That's why when you dial 911, that's why you can take your cell phone with you, but when you dial 911, if you are here at this community center now, 
What we will see if you dial 911 now, we will see your home address. We will not see 48 Public School Road, which is physically where you are now with your phone, okay? So in that case, you need to go to, to register your phone for the type of services, uh, emergency network services, so you can get that, that call, that mass notification that we will send out. You're gonna go to www.burnco.gov, okay? You can go through www.burnco.gov, B-E-R-N-C-O, short for Bern Bernalillo County. Okay, then you, got, you can either try and scroll through your way to emergency communications, or you can search through A through Z. Would it be the same thing? It will not. It will not. You will have to probably check with them, call their dispatch center, and see if they offer any type of services, and I think they do. I think they offer something maybe like Code Red, I think is their comparable service. Okay. Okay, so once you get to the um, uh, emergency communications page, you're going to look for mass notification sign up. Okay, and once you get to, to that sign up, just fill out the form. You can enter as many numbers as you would like. Everyone in the house cell number, um, if you have a fax number, our message even goes to fax numbers. So when I, when I do these notification messages, I make sure they go out through email if you sign up for that. I make sure they go out through fax numbers to SMS, and obviously they go out to your um, residential phone number as well. And when they go out, we actually do uh, voice message, and we actually do um, digital messages as well. So it will translate our digital text to audio. And if it doesn't translate based on your type of phone system, it will just send that as type text. Okay. Any other questions? And I'm sure uh, Stacy will make herself available to give more details on that after this I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, I just wanted to say one more thing. Uh, no to thanks in a couple of areas. First of all, these, these uh, that I know that the, the evacuation was inconvenient and uncomfortable and scary and dangerous in some ways, but I have to, I, I have to believe that at the very least we saved a number of structures in the Chilili area. I also believe that we may have saved some lives with that call that, that Captain Campos made on your behalf to try and get you out so that the firefighters could do their work. Um, Chief Gober was down there that, that day last year and we were talking to them directly and that's, that's how Captain Campos made that decision. And it was about your safety, it was about your property. And uh, as, as uncomfortable as that was for the entire community, it was the right call to make. And, and he did an excellent job representing you and protecting you that, uh, that day. Um, so I wanted to, again, recognize the work that he did and the Sheriff's Department did during that time period. And all of our partners, I mean, and not even all of them are here by any stretch of the imagination. The other thing I wanted to do was thank you as a community. Uh, we ended up, and we were asking for water because everybody, firefighters need water. Everybody that's displaced needs water. Water is, is life, really, and we needed bottled water badly. Well, w we ended up with so much bottled water. I mean, we ended up with a lot of bottled water. And yeah. <laughs> we, we had to find places to catalog all the goods and, and all of the generosity, if you will, all of the things that you brought to help other people. And your outpouring of love and of of support for everybody that was displaced was humbling in every sense of the word. So thank you for all of that. And remember, we're all in this together, one way or the other. And we're all carrying each other, put everybody on our, our shoulders and carry them when they're in their time of need. You showed that as a community last year. And I hope you never have to do it again. I told every one of those firefighters that came into town, both the type one and type two teams, I said, you all are the finest people I never want to see again. <laughs> and that's, that's really the truth. But we also live in a beautiful place that's 150 years into a 100-year fire cycle. So there's danger inherent in living in the East Mountains, and there's so much upside to living out here as well. So have, how many of you already have your go bags? 
All right, good, good. That's, that's pretty good. That's better than I thought it might. Well, you guys better have it. <laughs> There's always some smart aleck in the room. Have you noticed that? Now, here's the, here's the next question I have for you. See how well you do on this one. How many of you have your defensible space? That was actually pretty well. There you guys again. We got, we got some ringers up front. That's really critical. Now, we're not asking you right now to go out and create your defensible space because we've had actually some fire activity recently. About, what was it in the five, five, five acres burned? About five acres burned uh, in the Golden Fire. Um, but that was a little scary because that could have gotten away from us as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's something you got to be ready for. And in the fall, you notice we do the green waste days? Anybody participated in that? Part of the reason we only do that in the early spring and the fall is because we don't want people out there in the heat and the dry weather cutting down trees and perhaps with, with their chainsaws out there and don't have spark arresters or something unfortunate happened like happened with the dog head fire. I mean, they were doing the right thing. They were creating uh, a, f a more healthy, safer forest but something unforeseen happened and it started a forest fire. So that's the reason we try and encourage you to do that either in the early spring or in, in the fall when moisture levels are up and temperatures down and it's far better environment should something that we don't want to happen, happen. Give us a little more time to respond to it and perhaps not even catch a, anything on fire. So again, thank you for coming. Thanks again to Captain Campos for, for putting this together because this really was his brainchild. Um, and I think it's a lot of great information. Are we going to do questions or something here, Captain? Here we go. I just want to uh, recognize uh, Lieutenant Brian Fox. He's the wildland coordinator for the Albuquerque Fire Department. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've been in some incident command classes with him recently, and I'm glad he was in my group so that I could uh, pass that class. So <laughs> thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Um, one more thing I want to um, recognize is um, Sergeant Larry Corrin. He's the commander of our air unit. Um, Larry, if you don't mind talking real briefly about um, the Southwest um, interagency um, protocols that you guys have now and the mutual aid agreements that you guys have established recently. Yeah, so um, we've, uh, we've been fighting fires with the helicopters uh, for quite some time now. Um, Bernalillo County and surrounding counties, and uh, we've uh, we've received some recent recognition as, an, as uh, our two helicopters for the county are uh, are nationally recognized uh, extraction resources. So, as far as hoisting somebody out of, it, out of an area that they can't get out of, or uh, short hauling them out in case of a, a life situation, life or death type of situation, uh, we we have those assets available to you. Um, one of the things that uh, Stacy Lewis was talking about uh, as far as uh, communication, and I'll just, one of the things that kind of uh, struck me is, is we don't always have the ability to pull up your address in the helicopter. Um, sometimes we have to download equipment and whatnot. It's a good idea though, we do have GPS, so if we're able to punch in a, a lat long and uh, for your home or where you're at, that, that's a big help. So it's probably a good idea to at least uh, know what the lat long of your particular home is in case we end up having to go out in that area and for, for some reason or another. The other, the other thing I, I'll just point out real quick is, is um, you have probably, well, definitely, uh, some, of the, some of the brightest and most dedicated uh, public service personnel uh, in the state of New Mexico right here. And uh, the coordination that you see uh, going on here, I know you see a lot of county representatives, but you have guys like uh, Brian Fox, you, you have uh, Robert Brown here from the state forestry and our state fire and some other people who, I, who I've seen around. I don't know all their names, but uh, we work regularly with these folks and uh, oftentimes we train with them uh, throughout the year for situations that come up like the dog head fire. And um, when we do train with them, one of the big things is communication. It's no different than, than what Stacy was talking about and uh, communicating with our dispatch letting them know, getting on, on, to, on that system where, where you're in their, their database and we could uh, access your, at least your location and, um, and some other pertinent information. It's so important uh, that it, it could uh, actually jeopardize a mission without that communication for us. It, it's, it's everything. And so I, I don't have anything, otherwise I'll just keep on rambling on, but thank you. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, Judy's going to hand out. Um, sorry, do you mind? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chap Chaplain. Yeah, you, you get stuck in a corner and this is what happens. Uh, I kept on bumping into him the entire meeting. <laughs> Um, the volunteer chaplains unit, and Rachel is also here with me, or the VCU, uh, we did the donation and distribution sites for the Doghead Fire. Uh, that was um, quite the undertaking, considering we had a trailer, and that was it. We had people lining up, we had stuff that was being donated to us, some very useful, some not so useful. Uh, we did coordinate with the uh, Red Cross for a special, a couple of special needs that they had to see if we could fulfill it somehow, and we managed to do that uh, just through the public awareness and some uh, some good church friends were able to uh, step up to the plate and provide some of the items that were needed. Um, the volunteer chaplains unit is that's that that's a vol they're volunteers. They answer strictly to me, and then this man behind me, I answer directly to him. So if you, if you see my head go forward, it's him. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's how I got the bald spot done. <laughs> but that's what we did, and that's uh, our role inside the Doghead Fire. Rachel, do you have anything to add? No, just that all of that water that you all were so gracious to donate, all of that water that you were all so gracious to donate, yeah, we shucked a lot of water. I'm just saying. <laughs> I do. Ha we have one more person than than questions. I promise. Right after this, uh, Mayor, the Mayor of uh, Tejeras, uh, Gloria Chavez, uh, would like to talk about a recently enacted fire restricted ordinance. Um, the Village of Tejeras will be holding a public hearing tomorrow night at the Village Hall at five o'clock p.m. Um, to adopt. Um, ordinance banning, not a total ban, because we cannot um, by law do a total ban on fireworks, but we are doing uh, a big restriction, big restrictions on the fireworks. Uh, we've got that coming up uh, on Tuesday, and we hope everyone will do the safe thing and go to Albuquerque, not to light your fireworks, to go see them over there. So <laughs> um, we are, um, that will be a law that will be in place and can only be changed uh, through a public hearing. Um, and unfortunately, the governor did not call for um, restrictions, so we're limited on what we can and cannot adopt. Um, the Village of Tejeda's Fire Department will be here to assist should the need arise. Uh, we did work very well with the county last year, and um, uh, we were glad that things um, went not as smoothly as they should have, but it was a learning experience. But we did uh, work very well together. And I think the communication that was given throughout the time, having the meetings at the school, helped us all keep informed on what was going on. Um, so the village will be here to um, assist should the need arise. And um, we do have a water system, and we will use our water if it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So on that note, too, within Bernalillo County, I just want to remind everybody, um, we're coming up on the 4th of July. Uh, fireworks are non-permissible in the East Mountains. That means all fireworks, even the little firecrackers. Uh, so if you see somebody using fireworks use, or hear people using fireworks, please call our non-emergency number at 798-7000 uh, and report that. And, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> So that way we can get either an SO deputy out there to, to patrol the area and try to figure out who's using the fireworks or a, a deputy fire marshal. Uh, and if we do catch people, we will cite them and we will confiscate the fireworks. So, um, And on top of that, too, we just now we've got in with the uh, U.S. Forest Service going into stage two. We're kind of following suit. Uh, and so we're not allowing any kind of open burning uh, until we get some significant moisture. So again, if you guys see somebody burning anything, call that non-emergency number again and report it. That's just Burnley Hill County. Just Burnley Hill County. Okay, questions now. I'm Elizabeth Baldwin, and I live in Santa Fe County, and I was near the Golden Fire. Mm -hmm. 
and I think this problem is probably pertinent to a lot of areas in Bernalillo County too. We have a uh, neighborhood watch program where we have leads on every major street in our area and we phone our, the members on our street when there's an emergency. And we have their phone numbers and their emails. Well, one of the problems we had with this fire is that we knew immediately about the fire hours before 911, you know, said we were to evacuate. And so we started calling our neighbors immediately. But the problem is a very low percentage of people have landlines. And then we don't have cell phone service in the area because we just don't have signal. And so the cell phones can go over to Wi-Fi, but we have terrible internet service peer-to-peer. <laughs> <laughs> -peer. So as we were calling, and then all those people who were receiving the emergency calls, as we more and more people got on the Wi-Fi line and and it got very slow and we had a hard time calling people. And then we have an internet community social media kind of thing called Next Door. We also put all sorts of messages about the emergency on that. But the more phones that were used, the slower the Wi-Fi service, the slower we were able to get messages on the internet. So I think there are probably pockets all over New Mexico who have this same problem. And it's an advantage to those neighbors to know uh, way ahead of time, as far ahead of time as possible, that an evacuation could be coming. Those couple of hours make a big difference. So how can we get c better communication services? Th this would be my advice, and I'm speaking only for Bernalillo County. I would, I would suggest that you contact Santa Fe County, yeah. Can Santa Fe County Office of Emergency Management, um, Tom's counterparts up there. Um, what we would do, like Tom mentioned, is we'd put a lot of information on our AM broadcast of 1670 and 1690. You know, or depending on. Um, and that, and you can contact your emergency management department. Um, and I think that that would be a, a good solve for that area. I'm sure you get AM reception on your on your vehicles and in your homes there. So, next question. That goes to the overall lack of inter internet in the East Mountains. It's not just Santa Fe County. I mean, even in the sheriff's department down in Chile, there's no cell phone and there's no radio. Okay, so w some of that we're working on from the the radio standpoint. And I'm also going to throw this out here, East Mountain residents. Every time we try and put up a cell tower somewhere, which is the only way to get cell service, people are usually mad at me for approving a cell tower that we're putting up in the East Mountains, but yet they want cell service. So at, at some point, you have to balance some of these things, I mean, it becomes a safety issue at some point. Now, I would recommend that you go ahead and get traditional two-wire phone if you don't have access to consistent, uh, fast internet service instead of trying to go through the, the VoIP phone service. I know it, it stinks because it's much more expensive than voice over IP, uh, but it is pretty darn reliable and you can get into reverse 911 uh, systems. I don't know whether Santa Fe County has one, but I would recommend for your neighborhoods, don't rely too much on voice over IP or a Wi-Fi system that's wireless for emergency communications during these situations. One of the other tools that we can use is uh, the NOAA radios. So I don't know how many people have one. I just put one in my house a few weeks ago, and we got those thunder th thunderstorm warnings. My wife freaked out. Um, when we put out those alerts, we can go through the National Weather Service as well. So, you know, as another means of communication, again, we try in as many ways as possible, look to invest the 20 or $25 in a, in a weather radio, and they'll send those alerts out to provide that information. Does that repeat? Is it in the loop? Does it repeat? How does that 911 know that I am 
answered or that, or that I received or that call. So the way the system works is, at least the way ours is set up, yeah. we have ours set up that it will, thanks, it will give you a call back at least three times. Okay at least three times and try and make notification for you. The system knows when someone has at least picked up so that if we do have a citizen who calls in and they want to know, we heard that there was a, um, an emergency service message that or mass notification that came out and we didn't get it. But we can actually check the message system and verif go to and, and look at your particular phone number and verify if it was answered, if we reached an answering machine, or if the line or the handset was picked up. And so, but it does make three phone calls, at least our system does. I do not know how um, Santa Fe has their system set up. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does it leave a message? Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not sure about a message being left. I wasn't home at the original phone call. And at the end of the message, it says, if you want to repeat this message, hit one. I was kind of like, so I hit, the, I hit one, and I just heard the message again. Okay. So great. I mean, it, at, it told me I could repeat it, and I was able to do so. Great, great. I'm, like I said, I'm not sure. I'm not usually a recipient at the message, because I'm on the other end making sure it gets out. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for being Do the emergency services in Bernalillo County coordinate with the ARIES network of amateur radio? The, uh, it's uh, amateur radio emergency services. Is a group of people that do that for uh, volunteer work? Yes, sir. We actually have a, a very active ARIES group and RACES, and I think we're actually going to an OXCOM group. My counterpart in the office, Gary Surratt, is the, the lead on that. And if you want some information, I can get it to you after. Can somebody explain to me what happens to the animals when we uh, are evacuated? If, if we have an RV and we put our animals in the RV, can we just drive out? Yes, yes ma'am. And then if you come to one of the shelters, whether you stay at the shelter or not, you can drop the animals off there if you you know if you're looking to stay you know maybe at a hotel or something else that with your accommodations, but we could provide our animal services will take any of those animal animals in. Hi, my name is Louis Trujillo, and uh, I live in Sandia Park, and I'd like to know if Santa Fe County shares what went well with putting out the Golden Fire within approximately five hours and only five acres of uh, damage. Right, so part of that is that interagency cooperation or that interagency response. Um, part of my role too is a president of a MIFPA, which is the East Mountain Interagency, Interagency Fire Protection Association. Um, and that was formed back in the late 80s after several wildland fires. And, we, and the agency saw that there wasn't that interagency cooperation. Uh, so part of that is to get those agencies together, whether it's Bernalillo County, Santa Fe County, Sandoval County, Torrance County, U.S. Forest Service, New Mexico State Forestry, BLM, BLA, or BIA. Get all these agencies working together and training together so we know who everybody is and how what everybody does and knows everybody's roles. So, and that played a major role in that. Hi, I'm Dr. Laurel Danton, and I'm also a member of CERT, and I was taking care of the animals at the Torrance County Fairgrounds. We had a lot of dogs. We had sheep, goats. Um, we had wild dog that didn't like any people at all and took us a lot of time to, to work with him. Um, what I would suggest is that you bring the animals to the CERT um, uh, to the Torrance County Fairgrounds because we had a very good setup for them. We had um, truckloads of cattle being brought in, um, horses being brought in in trailers, um, sheep, um, chickens, turkeys, ducks, 
Um, we, we had all kinds of animals. It was really a fun experience for me, but very exhausting. And uh, the CERT team made it a very good place for the animals to be. So if you have animals that need a place to, to come, be sure and, and, and take advantage of the fact that CERT does a lot of training to take care of your animals. We do a lot of, um, we, we do a lot of skill setting to have the animals taken care of. They had people 24 hours available. We had people that were staying because they didn't want to leave their animals. We had one poor gentleman that was staying out um, with his sheep, and uh, he was just burning up. He had no hair on his head, so I gave him my cap. <laughs> That's why I can't farm a cert cap. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it, it was a, 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 an experience that was really well done, and, and even though we trained for this, we had... We, we hoped that it would work, and at the very end of it, we were glad that it did. So yeah. if, you, if you need help, please let us know. Thank you. What I was going to say is that these representatives of CERT came to, our, came to our community, the San Pedro Neighborhood Association, and a actually brought some, like, packs that were packed for ready to go, like for the animals, and after that, um, you can go to different communities and give talks and even show, well, how do you pack a dog bag? How do you pack a cat bag? My sister, ever since then, had all the dog bags ready. <laughs> Invite us to your community and we will put on That's a presentation right. showing how to do that. Just during an emergency. Can we count on that being available if there is an emergency? It will be on for sure. That would be within the probably the first two hours of the evacuation order. It would it takes about twenty to thirty minutes okay, to so the first notification will be by phone. Correct, sir. Okay. And then after that when you say you want to communicate, that's great. I just want to know how you communicate. So first notification by phone, then we're feeding to the radio station? Yes, sir. Okay. And then obviously other whatever methods that you know, social media might have a little bit more live. That radio station would be more of a recorded loop of information. Here's the shelter information. Here's the evacuation zones. Now, when you say social media, is there a particular social media that we should join to get those messages? I would, I would recommend any of the, the Burnco. Um, I don't know if you want to. We've got Bernalillo County NM on Facebook. Uh, I'm Andy Letterman with Bernalillo County Community Relations. Thank you. I should follow my own advice. We've got Bernalillo County YouTube. <laughs> We've got uh, Bernalillo County NM, and um, at Burn County, um, pardon me, Bernalillo County NM uh, is our Facebook handle, and uh, at Burn County is Twitter. Uh, additionally, the sheriff has um, his own uh, channels, which we encourage you to follow, and it, we always share messages in situations like this. So. Um, it's interesting, a lot of people are using it. A lot of people get their information that way, so. I have two or three questions. I'm a complete technological computer idiot. My first question is, I have a landline with CenturyLink. My number is totally unlisted. Do, am I still in the, re do I have to register? Am I still in the reverse 911? Okay. And my second question is, I would evacuate immediately, of course. Uh, I'm in Forest Park, one way in, one way out. I have a, where I go, my very elderly dog goes with me. I don't have to go to a shelter. I evacuate, but I can go to friend's house. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Question? I'd like to know if we're in town and this kind of information starts coming out, do we have to have certain um, ID? Do, how do we get back to our, our homes with our animals? Any possibilities? We're just, those animals are just out of luck. We're just out of luck. That's where, I don't know whether you can hear me, uh, that's where having a really good plan <laughs> with your neighbors comes in because they're not going to let you back into your home if they've, if they've closed it. Um, you know, I would recommend having Nixle 
especially in town because you'll find out what's going on here you know, on your phone. I do it all. I have Nixle as well for Sandoval County. I know they do it. Nixel is, is a notification system and it's run primarily out of emergency management. But we'll even put things like uh, a few weeks ago we had that SWAT situation on North 14 and emergency management put that out because people were going up and, and getting caught at the Burger Boy area and having to go back around. I was one of them. I was actually trying to get to Burger Boy. Uh, so I tried then to go around the other way. I couldn't get in from that. I ended up at Paco. Anyway, long story there. But um, make sure that you set something up with your neighbors because they're, they're the ones that are going to be helping you in that situation. And uh, there, were, there were all sorts of stories come from Doghead where people would try and talk their way in and get past, you know, the, the, uh, the deal and, and, or the roadblock. And we just can't do it because you're, you're endangering your own life and potentially a firefighter's life as well. So th that's just not something that they can do. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Yes. Hi, I'm Nicole Maxwell from the Mountain View Telegraph. And um, uh, this is in reference to, um, with a lot of the little fires and stuff that have been happening, people think there's smoke, what's going on? They're, they're relying on the social media stuff without calling the, the non-emergency line. And I know that, that Captain Campos, bless his heart, <laughs> sent, out a le sent out a letter saying, if, if you see something, call us so we can tell you what it is. Because sometimes it's not the wildfire. Sometimes it might be someone burning trash, or maybe it's just the, the other, um, like the smoke coming, from a, smoke coming from one of the other fires. And um, I'd like to thank you very much, sir, for, s for being so o open with communication. He puts out, it, he puts out a, a monthly, th there's some regular monthly newsletter from Bernalillo County Sheriff's and he's also very active with getting information to me that I disseminate out and also and yeah they can like subscribe to that can't they the public absolutely yeah so just not really a thank question you. just yeah thank you Nicole If I went to the right, of course, I couldn't go down the hill because that's where the fire was, so I went to the left, and that's where the roadblock was. So one officer, I said, oh, he said, leave your gate open because they won't break down your fence to go in to defend your place. Now, is that correct? S um, so if, if my place was on fire but my gate was locked, what would the fire department do? So there, there's two situations there. I mean, if you have defensible space around your home and you lock your gate, chances are your home's going to survive. Um, we will try to get access in there if we feel that we can protect the property after the fire has gone through and make sure there isn't any kind of smoldering type fires up against your house. Um, for a structure fire and you're not there, during the wildland fire, if it's already in fire, we're not going to go in there and try to put it out, of course. Um, but if it's just a regular structure fire and you're not home, we're going to break through that gate to probably put that fire out, so. Okay, so I did go back and I was allowed to make a U-turn. There was a fight going on about allowing me to go back <laughs> between, <laughs> but I did and I left the gate open. And so I think that's the safest okay. thing to do because then it you would have easy access. Yeah. If it's, it's easier for us if we have don't have to take the time to, to open up a gate. If the gate's open, we can drive in, take a look at the property and make sure it's protectable or and it's going to withstand that that fire front th coming through, then uh, it's e just easier for us and it's less time consuming so we can move on to the next house. And I know you're there protecting the property yeah. to, to try and keep any burglars yeah. from coming in or anything. So the other question that I had to myself, which having gone through this experience is, I wasn't sure, do I leave my windows open or closed? Close all your windows. Yeah. Close all your windows, close your doors, uh, turn off your swamp cooler, anything that's going to bring in that smoke, any kind of embers coming into the into your home is what you want to try to uh, eliminate and reduce. But don't lock the front door. Don't lock the door. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You ready? I don't oh, you're good. Yeah. I, um, I did see her walk in. I want to uh, mention Karen Takai from the United States Forest Service. Karen? 
Oh, New Mexico now. I'm sorry, from New Mexico. Uh, Karen does a does a good good job with the forestry department. Um, if you may. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, anyway, Karen Takai, I know like most of you for 20 something years. The reason I'm here is actually because I am a homeowner in uh, the East Mountains. I live on the Rincon Loop and I've been here for 27, 28 years now. And, and Tom invited me. <laughs> I, I didn't want to come down because, you know, like this is Bernalillo County's gig, you know, so I wanted to stay away. But uh, since you invited me, I accepted. I did ask my boss if I could go. <laughs> you got to do that, you know. But it, seriously, in that 27 years, it, this team in front of you is the finest I've seen. And it's a team, and it's stuff that got thrown back and forth is phenomenal. So. I feel blessed, and I feel really lucky we got you here, except for Tom. But everybody else, everybody Sorry, else. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. But everybody else, um, it's thrilled. During the dog head, we had an unusual situation where we weren't able to get communications up during that uh, evening fast enough for the communities out there to call and get information. So uh, we went into the EOC. We tried to stand it up here. We didn't have the phone lines at the time, but I think you bought 125 phones, didn't you? So that's not going to happen again. But um, we did move down where the type one team was. We did set up um, and it worked fairly well. We were lucky because it was so interagency out there. We had Dave Shell, raise your hand, uh, he's a PIO uh, trained uh, with the type one team and type two team. So he came in and John Helmick and a few other people and they helped support that uh, call center for you to come in, be able to get information as fast as possible. So it was a joint information center, worked really well. The second thing we are lucky is we didn't have a lot of public information officers. So the commissioner and uh, Tia Bland and a few others, they actually came in, Andy was there, and a few others actually held together that group. And we staffed at the first few night 24 seven, not seven, but 24, three or four. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, were, we were lucky to have those lines going. So, um, and then the social media was like, Andy was right on it and a few others. So. We are really lucky. We thank you for that because that's what made the success. It wasn't one person. It was all of us together. And then the other thing is, did you talk about insurance? Okay, so I'm on a mission from my cabinet secretary, and we're going to start working a little bit harder on talking about insurance to our communities when there's fire. When there is a fire, you have to have insurance because the, say, if you do lose your home, Okay, there has to be approximately 125 homes, permanent homes, lost for FEMA to step in. Marcel, you can help me on this too if I screw this up, okay? Marcel is from Department of Homeland Security also. So thank you, yeah. So the concept is that if you don't have insurance, FEMA, this is the bottom line, FEMA is not going to come in and give you a lot of money for your home. There are certain levels that you have to reach before they're even going to consider whether or not they're going to give you money for the loss of a home. Approximately, and this changes depending on location, economic um, issues in the community. There's a few things that you have to go through before they determine what's going to happen. But the first level is at 100, and actually you can help me too. Right? I mean, that's what you do. That's your job. Yeah. You know? I'm just a, an information officer. I don't know anything. I just mimic you guys. But you have 125 homes. They have to be permanent homes, correct? And then they also have to be totally destroyed. No vehicles, no homes, nothing. Then I heard the most you might get is $33,000. The most. So the message from the cabinet secretary was, uh, we got to start a campaign to, sh to inform people that it's real important that you look at your insurance, see what you're covered for, because FEMA is not the insurance for anybody. You know, they'll give you a little bit, they'll give as much as they can, but with all the fires across the nation, I can't imagine that we would have enough money in the government to cover. So, anything you want to add? 
Also, keep in mind that a lot of a lot of the insurance companies now are denying coverage or dropping coverage if you do not have your defensible space around your home. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're wanting to know what you can do to help prevent a fire around your home, call my office. I'll, I'll leave some cards up. Um, we're more than happy to come out and do a, a site assessment. <coughs> excuse me, a site assessment, and help you develop that defensible space or that vegetation management plan around your home. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, two quick questions. One is, how much space is defensible space? And the other one is, if there is an evacuation, and supposing I'm not home, my animals are taken somewhere, what do I need to reclaim them? So I'll let you go on the animal first, and then the human first. <laughs> so the defensible space question is a tough question to answer because it's going to be site-specific and what you're willing to do. Um, we like to see 30 feet away from the home, and that doesn't mean uh, clear vegetation away from the home. That means having a management plan around your home that has fire-resistant and uh, non-fire-prone type vegetation, meaning that it's it stays green, it's well-maintained, you water it, it keeps the fuel moisture up, that sort of thing. And then out to 100 feet is when you start doing uh, start doing some of the, the heavier type management where you're, you're thinning the forest, that sort of thing. <coughs> On the animal side of it, and Tom can speak a little bit of it, but I know you, you're going to need proof of ownership of the animal, uh, so we recommend either having microchips or tags, that sort of thing, on your animals. And I, I, and I don't want to speak for our animal services, but I imagine it's really no different than if your dog runs off and it's picked up by animal services, whatever that process would be if they're going to microchip. I believe that's an ordinance for the, the chipping. Um, so it would be that process there. By no, yeah, by no means does our animal service want to keep your dog. <laughs> Uh, well, most of the shelters will have someone that will have a chip reader. You, um, we had a livestock inspector at the Estancia shelter every day. I had one there, and I have veterinarians that have them. Microchipping is the best thing. Uh, I would also encourage you when you make your go bags for your animals that you include a picture of the animal and a picture of you with the animal <laughs> along with your veterinarian information. Um, but if you have them microchipped, that's your best chance of getting them back uh, and have that microchip information up to date because they're going to show up at, you know, possibly two or three shelters in the area and it, it'll be a lot easier to track them down. If they end up at one of the shelters, they will be cared for, okay, and they will be kept there. But you will have to prove that that animal belongs to you. So have your paperwork, have it in your go bag and maybe have it in a second place uh, where you can access it if you can't get back to the house. But microchipping is always your best, safest bet. Tags. Tags. Yeah, if they can keep tags on them, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Tags and markings you recognize because seeing people put tags on another animal, it has to be something in writing, like a lady certificate of um, documentation. When the microchips are put in, get a lot of little stickers with all the numbers where you put them in your car or on your, in your wallet, tons of places. This is nice. Um, I live in Edgewood. Has there been or will there be a similar outreach in San Diego, I mean, it's not San Diego. <laughs> It'd be nice, wouldn't it? That would be nice. Sorry, now you know where I came from. Anyway, uh, Santa Fe County, Edgewood. Yeah, I'd ask you to contact their emergency management. But has there been? Not that I know. You know? Okay, okay. okay we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. I will say that uh, we'll make ourselves available. We'll mingle around. We got one more time for one more question in the back. Here you go. You mess it up. In the event there's an evacuation of Sandy and Knowles, are there any special instructions we'd have to adhere to since I understand there's only one way in and one way out? 
just listen to the instructions in the evacuation order. And I guarantee there'll be tens upon tens of 20 of deputies out there that will directly direct you exactly where you need to go. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, last thing. We're just gonna pass it I just want to mention just one real quick thing. First of all, thank you all for coming. I think it's important that as a, as a community, you all are out here because we know the importance it is to you. Uh, but I did want to bring up a very quick item. Keep in mind, evacuations, and we've talked a little bit about that, and that's kind of the purpose of this meeting is to talk a little bit about that. They're inconvenient. We don't like to do it if we don't have to. Certainly, we talked a little bit about early warnings. When you know there's a fire, we're going to get that information out, and we're going to hit every possible way that we can, whether it's whether it's through the Nixle system, whether it's through radio, television, we're going to hit it as many ways as we can. Uh, but keep in mind, once we do that, um, every, and, and I don't want to end this in a downer, but every year in this nation, trained firefighters die in forest fires. And, and the, the unpredictability of fires is what makes that happen. So when we call these things, it's really important that people are listening to us and, and making those moves early and not waiting till the last minute. So again, it's just, just a reminder, you all live out in, in the wildland interface, so you know the importance, but it's just a reminder, and thank you for, for coming out. Okay, thank you everybody, I appreciate you guys coming. Like I said, we'll be, we'll be around if you need to contact me. I'll have my cards up here on the table if you wanna email me, I usually get back to you everybody within 48 hours.